Welcome back to the Anti-Meta Meta Club. This week's Race C is a race that we've seen many times before, but with a new meta comes a new Anti-Meta. On top of that, Race B is actually almost exactly the same as Race C was a couple weeks ago, so the Bathurst guide that I made before actually still works. You can check that one out if you're looking for a Race B guide. Anyways, let's get on with it. Here's a guide for Race C. This week's Anti-Meta car is the Renault Megane, the mid-engine rear-wheel drive trophy edition specifically. In previous iterations of this race, this car has actually been the meta car, but since the G70 is so good now, it's so fast, this car is the perfect anti-meta car. This car's main weakness is its top speed, but since it handles so incredibly well, has so much grip coming out of corners, and is also really good on tires, you can definitely make it work against the G70 as I'm going to show you at the end of this video. I managed to get a 128.513, which at the time was good for 34th place globally, making it the third fastest Megane. As you can see from this leaderboard, as well as the races, if you've done any of the races, the G70 is very clearly the meta car, but this car has some distinct advantages against it, and you can definitely make it work as an anti-meta car. The first breaking point comes up really fast. About halfway between the 2 and 1 marker boards on the left is when you start braking. Using less than 100% braking force, we're going to start turning in as soon as we start braking, then trail brake all the way to the apex, making sure that you're staying on the brakes long enough so that the car doesn't unsettle the front end on the way down the hill to the apex. Continue steering in as you gently get on the throttle, making sure you don't hit the throttle too heavily because it's really easy to go off right here. You can go all the way up on the colored portion of the curb though. Pull back all the way onto the track and get your car settled before the next braking point, which is right here at this red mark on the barrier to the left. Brake heavily, get down to third gear, and turn in directly at this white marker board on the left. Continue trail braking in, downshifting to second gear, aiming to hit the apex just after the midpoint of the corner. The red dot is moved all the way to the right, indicating how much I'm steering, but you can actually steer beyond that point. You'll notice that I'm off the throttle and the brakes, and I'm continuing to steer until the car is pointed the direction I want to go, then I shift up to third gear before accelerating. From here, go straight to the white marker board in the distance, making sure that you shift up to fourth gear or else you're going to hit the rev limiter before the braking zone. Right at this brown piece of the curb, you're going to hit the brakes and immediately start trail braking in. Continue adding steering as you trail brake in, and as soon as you hit the apex, continue steering and hit the throttle still in third gear. You can actually go all the way up on this green part of the curb and put two tires in the grass, though it's really risky putting two tires in the grass. I'd try to avoid that if I were you. Staying as close to the grass without touching it as you can, you're going to turn in at this white marker board here on the right and start braking as soon as you get to the end of this brown part of the curb. Downshift to third almost immediately, continue turning in, and as you bleed off more speed, you can then downshift to second gear before popping it up to third gear and getting on the throttle at the apex or right before. You can continue steering this car without losing any momentum, and as long as you stay on the track, you can use that last part of the brown curbing and you should be totally fine. Just don't steer too much and don't get on the throttle too heavily and you should be totally fine and not have to deal with any kind of oversteer. If you are really rough or if you steer too much, you will have to deal with oversteer, which will kill your momentum and ruin your life. For the next braking zone, we're actually not going to use the white marker boards on the left. On the right, you can see a red and green part of the barrier. When you get all the way in front of that, that's when you want to start to brake. Never reaching 100% brake pressure, we're going to turn in at the final marker board on the left, downshift to fourth gear, and patiently get all the way up to the apex before applying the throttle. This corner is tricky because too much or too little steering will actually have the same effect. On this red and green part of the barrier to the left, right before that, you're going to hit the brakes heavily but not 100% and immediately start trail braking in. Downshifting to third and then popping it back up to fourth right before you hit the apex will allow you to continue rotating beyond the apex, then you can get back on the throttle without going wide. Pay attention to the line that I take as I approach the next corner. It's kind of strange in that it's not a smooth curve, so you've got to kind of stay all the way to the side, then cut a little bit in, then approach the outside again right before this final brake marker, and that's when you're going to hit the brakes. What you've got to make sure is that as you hit the brakes, you don't understeer into the grass, so make sure you give yourself ample space on the left to hit the brakes, understeer a little bit before trail braking in right here to try to get all the way up on this corner, continuing to steer past and gently getting back in the throttle, making sure that you're not sliding out and making sure that you're not just plowing into the grass. Line up on the right early and about two car lengths before the final marker board on the right, you're gonna hit the brakes, downshift to third, turn in right after the marker board, and you're gonna try to trail brake, but come off the brakes entirely before you hit the curb. When you do hit the curb, add more steering, and then immediately get on that throttle. The car can take a lot of throttle coming out of that corner, so be aggressive, but don't be too sharp. Moving yourself to the left side of the track, we're gonna look for the final white 
marker board on the left, and we're gonna use the same idea that we had for the last corner. You're gonna break about two car lengths before it. You're gonna break heavily, but not 100%, and you're gonna start turning in directly after the marker board. You wanna linger on the brakes and be really gentle before you get on the throttle. As you can see, the track kind of dips down right after the point where you hit the throttle, so you've gotta be prepared for a little bit of understeer. If you wait for after the dip, it's gonna to be too long, so make sure you get on the throttle early and just be prepared for a little bit of understeer as you get on the throttle. The shortest line is all the way on the right, and that's your lap. There's a lot of elevation change that you have to deal with in this track, especially T1. As you can see, it's a really heavy downhill slope, so you've got to be very careful as you linger on the brakes and then gently get on the throttle because it's very easy to send yourself all the way off the track because you can induce understeer or oversteer with any kind of elevation change very easily. And when you're getting on the throttle going down a hill, the front end likes to wash out so your front tires essentially don't have any more bite and that's why a lot of people just drive entirely off the track. This left-hander continually gets tighter and it's slightly uphill so it's very important that you don't get any kind of oversteer but it's also very easy to get oversteer. Braking late and using all of this car's cornering capabilities is key to getting a good lap around here as well as driving fast and having good pace in the race. This corner is deceptive because you have to bleed off speed slowly, maintain speed through the corner, and make sure you don't steer too little or too much because you can get understeer either way. You've got to use at least a little bit of this curb here on the right, but if you use too much, if your left tires touch it, then it can easily send you bouncing entirely off the track. If you find yourself losing time here, you're probably either apexing too early or not carrying enough speed. You can carry a massive amount of speed through there. This penultimate left-hander is really easy to go flat on throttle after as long as you use that inside curb and you carry a lot of speed. The final corner, like the first, features a really big downslope right as you're about to get on the throttle, so just be prepared for understeer and you shouldn't have any kind of issues with it. And of course, finish all the way on the right side of the track. I had a little bit of trouble today just getting a good race in, so at the end of the night, after I'd done my lap, I decided to give one more shot trying to get a really good race to showcase what this car can do against the G70, and I had a fantastic time, and I definitely did get a chance to show off what this car can do. A recurring theme in Gran Turismo daily races that require a strategy has been for the past few years to just make one pit stop required and not actually make the tire wear high enough to really justify changing tires with any of the cars. Even the heavy tire wear all wheel drive cars are not needing to change tires. That doesn't however mean that they don't suffer the effects of high tire wear. It just means that they're actually fast enough to not have to worry too much about it. But the Megan has incredible tire wear, so at the end of the race, you'll actually have a distinct advantage against the Metacar. Now, if you've been with me for a while, you probably know exactly what the strategy is going to be. If you're starting from the back, you most likely want to pit really early, even after lap one. If you're starting from the front, you probably want to pit as close to the end of the race as possible. However, there are obviously different things that can affect when you want to pit, and so you've got to really watch out for certain things. The main idea is actually to pit when you don't have to worry about anyone else. I just got distracted because I'd completely forgotten that that guy accidentally sideswiped me. Afterwards, it looked like he completely held back and didn't even try to be aggressive at all. I think he feels bad. Texera, Teixeira, I don't know how to say your name. You don't need to feel bad. I know that you didn't do that on purpose, so don't sweat it if you're watching. Anyways, back to the strategy. What I'm trying to say is that when you go into the pits, you want to ensure that there's no one else either coming out of the pits with you or that will be on their lap when you're coming out of the pits. You just don't wanna to have to deal with traffic. It's difficult enough with this car pulling off any kind of move and then staying in front of one of the meta cars, but if you have to deal with two of them or more, it's gonna be incredibly difficult to both get in front of them or stay in front of them because if they work together whatsoever, or if you have to really compromise your driving line, they're gonna have the distinct advantage of having more power and the all-wheel drive grip. Now back to the strategy itself. My plan right now is to ensure that I go into the pits as long as the guy in front or maybe the couple guys in front of me do not go in the pits right before. If they do in fact go in the pits, I'm gonna try to avoid going in the pits, assuming that there isn't anyone else close enough that can slow me down on the next lap. Now I decided to definitely go in the pits here because it wasn't for another five or six positions ahead that the drivers are going to the pits. So I was going to have some free air and the people higher up are going to be faster. So the people that I do end up coming out of the pits with will be faster than the people who decided not to pit. All of these are positives. You might be thinking that it could be beneficial to stay within the slipstream of one of the G70s considering the fact that they have really high top speed and this car has really low top speed. But because this car is a handling car, because 
the best thing that this card does is handle really well and break late they're just going to really get in the way and the dirty air is going to affect the super handling of this car negatively of course less negatively than it if it wasn't a handling car but still enough to really dull the positive effects of this car dull the strengths of this car if you want to do really good with this car against the meta your best choice is to try to just have a completely solo race stay away from everyone else pit when there's no one else around you and just do the best laps you possibly can for 11 laps in a row it isn't until lap four that we get close enough to even consider making a move on the guys ahead in those last two laps i picked up two positions and i didn't actually have to race those guys on track whatsoever while this is common knowledge for people who have been in the racing community or follow racing, I found that a lot of Gran Turismo players are actually video game fans who are converted to racing fans or just straight up video game fans that may or may not know about actual racing strategies. So I'm going to take a second to explain exactly what's going on. In this game, essentially every single pit stop is the exact same length of time. So the laps that I set after I came out of the pit stop were so much faster than the laps set by the guys who were in front of me before they went in the pit stop that after serving the same amount of time in the pits, they ended up multiple seconds behind me. This is what we call an undercut. Now, an actual undercut with a more complex strategy would involve having faster tires, potentially or more fresh tires as you come out of the pits. So the discrepancy in pace has a lot to do with the actual pit stop itself rather than just the timing of the pit. Now the benefit to passing them because of the pit strategy is that you don't have to waste time racing them on track because if you waste a few seconds racing them on track, then other people are gonna be able to benefit from that. So by effectively just lapping as fast as I could while they were lapping a bit slower than me, I didn't have to waste any time battling them and I got the benefit of getting all the way in front of them. I'm realizing that I spoke for a long time and I don't know if I did a great job of explaining all of that so if you have any questions about that please ask me in the comments and if anyone has any more insight please feel free to also answer any questions asked by the community in the comments. Now you may have seen that I tried to push Creedy Mag before the final corner of the last lap and that's because I knew that if I tried to pass him right before the long straight he would most likely just pass me and then we would both waste time trying to race each other. So instead I was hoping to push him which might give him the false sense of security that I might not try to pass him but it also allows both of us to keep up momentum so then I can try to pass him at a position that wouldn't cost me a lot of time. As you can see, he was a very clean racer and allowed me to pass on the outside and then make that late diving inside pass for the left. I really appreciated his race craft and I really enjoy racing guys like that. So big shout out to Greedy Mag. Now that we're ahead of him, we can hope that the dirty air will make it so it's harder for him to follow us through any of the corners and then that can nullify the massive power advantage that he has over our car. My goal right here was to try to get as close to Zarathustra as I could. Zar Zarathustra? I do not know how to say his name. Get as close to him as possible so when he serves the penalty, I'd be able to pass him. But I wasn't close enough at all, and so he started defending on the inside. Now, I wasn't quite sure if I could trust him, but I gave him trust, and luckily he didn't push me off. So again, really great racing from both of these guys. Thinking he was going to defend the inside, I decided to try to outbreak him on the outside, but then kind of lost my nerve because it looked like he was going to track out. He did end up tracking out, but he was all the way in front of me, so really no harm, no foul, and then I lost the position to Creedy Mag once again. Instead of trying to continue the battle right now, what I wanted to do was slot in behind both of them and just try to get all of our momentum back up, so again, I could try to pull off a pass when it was more convenient for all of us and it didn't waste a lot of time. Later on in the lap, Zarathustra got another penalty, and they both went pretty slow, so I decided to give Creedy some boost so he could possibly pull off a pass, and unfortunately, they made a little bit of contact. I thought that Zarathustra was going to go off because of that contact, but instead, he actually maintained a tight line. We collided just a little bit, but he immediately changed his line to give me space, and I think we both realized at that point it wasn't malicious, it wasn't intentional, and he already had a penalty anyway, so... He was going to lose that position anyways. I don't think he was too mad about that. And afterwards, he did congratulate me and tell me that it was a good race and thank me for the race. So I don't think he was upset about that. I would like to know what you guys think, though, but it did seem just like a racing incident. I think I was going to get past him anyways, and I don't think I necessarily pushed him out of the way. Either way, I always feel bad when there's any kind of contact, but I am confident that that was still a clean move. It was just, just a little bit of a racing incident, just a little bit of rubbing his racing kind of energy. 
Now with Creedy, I know that he is a good driver. He's fast. And so I didn't actually have any plans to try to be aggressive and pass him just yet. In fact, I was planning on pushing him initially, and then he moved all the way to the left, which kind of signaled to me that he's not going to even intend on defending whatsoever. So I pulled to the inside and just as I guessed, he let me go entirely. When he let me go before he also flashed his lights, I think probably just saying, go for it. I know that we don't want to battle. I know you're a little bit quicker now. And so I put on my hazards, left him on for a little bit too long. Kind of looked like a really old person driving, leaving their blinkers on, but at least he knows that I was thankful. So again, thank you, Creedy Mag. Big shout out to that guy. I really enjoyed racing him and it makes me really want to go and race in the EMEA region a lot more. Jumping forward all the way to the end of the race, you can see that I actually didn't have to deal with any more traffic whatsoever, so the strategy worked out perfectly. And in fact, we're in fourth place, just feet away from the top three when one of them goes off. It looked like Nicolaitis had ended up pushing off Ark, and further evidence to suggest that is the fact that he pulled over to try to give the spot back. Now, obviously you don't want to make any contact, but if you do make contact with someone, if you push them off, then the gentlemanly thing is to let them go. I unfortunately could not pass STE or ST. I'm not sure what his name is, but I think with one more lap, I would have had the win. Or if I was just able to pass the other guys cleaner or a little bit faster, then I could have had the win almost all the way from the back. But either way, it was a great race. And I'm really glad that I showed off what the McGann can do against the G70, against the Metacar. And I hope you guys enjoyed, and I hope you got some ideas on how you can use the anti-metacar against the metacar. Thank you very much. Like always, I'm going to leave you with a look at my current members. I love every single one of you guys very much. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't done it already, and I will see you soon.